This morning we're concluding our message series from the book of James called Life Lessons. Every Sunday we've been going through one chapter in James and today we come to James chapter 5. Our message today is entitled, Adjust Your Attitudes. Attitudes are the way that we think or feel about something or someone. Our attitudes are usually an emotional response to a particular situation. Now, many people think they can't control their attitudes. However, the Bible teaches us that we can control or adjust our attitudes with the Lord's help. In fact, God's word instructs us to adjust our attitudes in many places. And God never tells us to do something that we can't do with his help. Our attitudes can either be wrong, sinful attitudes, or they can be right, godly attitudes. So let's look at a story from the first book in the Bible, Genesis, that contrasts a right and a wrong attitude in two brothers. Now the background to this story is that Adam and Eve had sinned by eating of the forbidden fruit. God had cast them out of the Garden of Eden and a curse had come upon both them and the whole earth. And yet God blessed Adam and Eve with the birth of two boys. The first son was Cain and the second was Abel. Let's pick up the story in Genesis 4 verse 3. It says, In the course of time, <clears throat> Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Now, Adam and Eve had taught their children about the Lord and the need to worship him. Both brothers brought offerings to the Lord from their respective vocations. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. But we are told that God accepted both Abel and his offering, but not Cain and his offering. Why? What was the difference? There's been a lot of speculation about the difference in the offerings, but Hebrews 11.4 tells us what the difference was. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he has was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And so the difference in the offerings lay in the heart attitudes of each brother. Abel offered worship in faith, whereas Cain just went through the motions. Well, let's look at what happened next. Verse 5, so, so Cain was very angry, and his faith fell. face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And so the Lord spoke to Cain and instructed him to adjust his attitudes. Cain was angry at God and his brother and his face fell. He was depressed. God warned Cain that his wrong attitudes were a prelude to Wrong actions. Sin was crouching like a ravenous lion, ready to devour him if he did not rule over it. Now, we know from the rest of the story that Cain did not make the right choice. He did not adjust his attitudes. Cain gave in to anger and jealousy and murdered his brother Abel. Now, today we want to learn how to make the right choice to have godly attitudes. The first attitude that we need to learn about from James is how to be generous. James 5 verse 1 begins and says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. And so James, never one to mince words, begins with a, a criticism of the wealthy. He addresses people who are rich and have put their trust in their wealth. Now, is he addressing believers or unbelievers? Well, it really isn't clear, but it doesn't matter because the truth applies to everyone. He continues in verse 3 and says, Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. And so James continues by indicating that judgment is coming for the ungodly rich. 
And what is their sin? Well, they have laid up treasure on earth in the last days. Now, the people of James' day were living in the last days, and so are we. The last days are the time between when Jesus ascended into heaven and when he is going to return. So what does it mean to lay up treasure on earth? Well, it is to put your hope and trust in your wealth that you have stored up, bank accounts, stocks, other places. And Jesus told us that we are not to lay up treasure on earth, but to lay up treasure in heaven. We lay up treasure in heaven by giving to expand the kingdom of God rather than to simply spend it on ourselves. James continues in verse 4. He says, Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. And so James expands on, on the sin of the wealthy. They have not paid their workers fairly in order to increase their own profits. They live in luxury. They live in self-indulgence when others live in poverty and without the necessities of life. So clearly these rich people had not used their blessing to bless others, but only on themselves. Now, how should we live with our money, the money that God has blessed us with? Well, we ought to be generous to those who are needy around us. Now, is it a sin simply to be wealthy? Well, we must say not in every case, but Jesus taught us that it was extremely difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because they tend to trust in their riches rather than God. Jesus in the Gospels instructed a rich young ruler to give away his riches and to follow him. But this rich young ruler refused. His riches were more important to him than God and his eternity. And so God desires for us to have a generous attitude, not a greedy or stingy attitude. An attitude of faith that allows us to give to God and others, believing that God will provide for us as well. We mustn't put our trust in our money, nor must we worry if we don't have enough. All that we have comes from God as we seek to serve him with all that he's entrusted to us. He will provide all of our needs. As we are faithful to give our tithes and offerings to our local church and faith promises to support missionaries around the world, God will take care of our needs. Now, some people think that they can't give because they won't have enough to live on if they do. But God tells us to trust him. If we give to him what his word commands, he will take care of us. A generous attitude is the result of a faith-filled heart. Now, the second attitude that God wants us to have is to be patient in suffering. James 5, verse 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So in this next section, James talks to us about the attitude of patience. We need to be patient until the Lord returns. Now, the coming of the Lord has been imminent since Jesus ascended into heaven. The imminent return of the Lord means that it could happen at any time. That was true in James' time, and it is true today. The opposite of patience is to be impatient or worried or stressed out about things. Many things in life are are like a farmer sowing seeds into his field. He needs to be patient until the seed germinates, till the seed grows and eventually brings the harvest. In the same way, we need to be patient in every aspect of life, waiting for the Lord to act and to bring a crop of blessing. In it all, we remember that when Jesus comes again, everything will be made right. And so we wait in patience for the, for the coming of the Lord. 
In verse 9, James continues and says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, when we become impatient with another person, what do we tend to do? Well, we tend to grumble against them. Maybe they moved too slow, or they did something we didn't like, or they did something wrong. To grumble against another person is, is to judge them, which James has previously instructed us to avoid. When we remember that the Lord's return as a judge is imminent, it will help us to be more patient with others. He continues in verse 10 and says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So finally, in this section, James reminds us of the patience of the Old Testament prophets and of Job. They all went through suffering of many kinds, and yet their faith in God remained strong as they were patient. They were steadfast in their faith, and God blessed them both in this life and in eternity. We must be patient in suffering. Now, we face many unforeseen difficulties in these days. Some is due to the ongoing pandemic, others due to economic issues, and yet other difficulties are simply due to the broken world that we live in. Patience is an attitude that comes from having a strong faith in God. When we choose not to worry, but to put our faith in God, He will help us have patience. To have patience is to trust God to work out our future. All of our difficulties or suffering in this life is momentary compared to eternity. Most difficulties don't last a long time, even compared to our lives. Some may last a lifetime, but God is there to give us patience, to stand steadfast and trust in Him. Now, patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of patience has a chance to grow only when we go through difficult circumstances. Some of the prophets were, were not rewarded outwardly in this life. Job was. We don't know the future, but we do know the one who holds the future in his hands as we are patient in suffering. The third attitude that God wants to develop in us that we need to adjust is to learn to depend on God. James 5 verse 13 says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, James has just talked about being patient in suffering. And so what are we to do when we are suffering? Well, James here tells us to pray. If things are going well, we praise God. If you're sick, which is a form of suffering, call on the church leaders to pray for you. After the service each Sunday at Life Church, we're always available for prayer. So just come up to me, to Carol or another leader, and we'll pray for you. James goes on in verse 15 and says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So in these verses, James gives us a wonderful promise. When we pray for the sick with faith, God will heal that person. It's important that, that any sins of the sick person be confessed. Why? Because unconfessed sin can stand in the way of healing. Prayer is evidence of faith in God and it has great power as we learn to trust God. Now, James concludes in verse 19. He says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, 
let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So in these last verses in the chapter, James speaks of a spiritual sickness. The picture that comes to mind is a sheep wandering from the flock, here described as wandering from the truth. People wander from the truth when they begin to believe the lies of Satan and the deceptions of false teachers. We are to make an effort to bring back wanderers from their sin back into the church family. And how is that accomplished? Well, by patient prayer, by trusting God to work in their lives and giving us the words to say to draw them back. Now, James is, is clearly talking about believers who knew the truth, but have wandered away from it. If they are not brought back, their soul will experience eternal death. And as wandering away from God's truth is certainly a sin, bringing the wanderer back will involve their repentance for a multitude of sins. And so we must depend on God to guide us to bring the wanderers back home. And so we see that prayer is the key to having right attitudes. Not just any prayer, but prayer prayed in faith, believing that God will answer. The example given in this passage, which we didn't have time to read, is, is the story of Elijah. Elijah's prayers impacted the weather. They stopped the rain, allowed rain to come again. They were so powerful. And Elijah, James says, was a man just like us. So our prayers can be just as powerful and effective as his. If you're sick in body or know someone who is, I'd encourage you again at the end of the service to find me, Pastor Dan Carroll, or another leader outside. We'll, we'll pray the prayer of faith over you. Now, we also have a Seek God prayer meeting every Wednesday, except the first Wednesdays at 7 p.m. via Zoom. We'd love to have even more people join us. And that is another opportunity to have your prayer needs prayed for. And so our dependence on God is measured by our prayer lives. Today, we've, we've talked about adjusting our attitudes to becoming more godly. God desires for us to, to have generous attitudes that give freely to God, believing that he'll reward us and supply our needs. God instructs us to be patient in suffering, looking forward to his imminent return. And finally, we show our dependence on God by seeking him in prayer. And as we look to God to adjust our attitudes, it positions us to be both blessed and to be a greater blessing to others. Now this morning, I'd like to give you an opportunity to become a believer, a follower of Jesus. If you've never committed your life to him, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me and be born again. To become a believer, you need to do three things. First of all, you need to admit that you've sinned and turn away from that sin. Repent. Secondly, believe that Jesus died to forgive you and rose from the dead. And finally, commit your life to following him as your Lord and Savior. So let's pray. I'd encourage you to pray along with me. Something like this. Father, today, I admit that I've sinned. I admit that I've done wrong things. And I repent. I turn away from that sin. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that my sins might be forgiven. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you as my Lord and Savior all the days of my life. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, we thank you for this practical teaching from James on adjusting our attitudes. Forgive us for the wrong attitudes that sometimes we've hung on to. We ask for your help and developing right attitudes. Help us to be generous with the resources you've blessed us with. When we encounter suffering or difficult circumstances, we, we pray that we would learn patience as we wait for your answer. Thank you that you're coming again and you're gonna right every wrong in our world. And finally, teach us how to depend on you through prayer in every circumstance, in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ or would like more information, we encourage you to connect with us. 
should be a link below in this video or you can connect on our website. We'll pray for you and offer you some helpful materials. Our website is at lifechurchstlouis.org. A lot more information there. Our Sunday morning services are now open at 10 a.m. at 15036 Clayton Road in Chesterfield. You're invited, uh, you're invited to attend if you live in the St. Louis area. Online donations are available to help us reach more people for Jesus at lcstl.org slash give. And next Sunday, we're beginning a new message series called Courageous Leadership. It's going to be from the book of Joshua, and our message will be Leadership Qualities. So God bless and have a great week.